We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast was recorded, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past and present. It's February 6th, 2021, and we're in a hotel in the middle of Myanmar. Australian economist Sean Turnell is checking out. He's leaving early and with good reason. At 5am this morning, an anonymous email dropped in his inbox. You don't know me, but a friend of mine who works at your hotel has just told me that since 4am this morning, military intelligence and police have taken over the hotel security cameras. One of these is monitoring your door right now. You need to leave as soon as you can. Thank you for what you have done for our country. Please. Pray for us. It's a message Sean's been expecting for the last five days, ever since the military took over the country and imprisoned civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Sean was her economic advisor, helping to lay the foundations for a true democracy. Now, the military leadership is coming for him. As he returns his room key and waits for a receipt, he can feel police gathering behind him. He's not going home. He'll spend the next 650 days locked in some of Southeast Asia's most dangerous prisons. I'm Matt Middleton, and this is Head Game. Today, how eternal optimism helped a mild-mannered economist from Sydney survive Myanmar's notorious insane prison. Sean. Welcome to Head Game. That voice note changed your life forever. Is that correct? Absolutely, mate. Took me straight back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I got that, yeah, as I say, really early in the morning. The military coup in Myanmar had taken place a few days earlier. I'd feared something like this. And to see that, I think the blood just drained from my face. And I thought, okay, I've got to get out. But I knew I couldn't. You were almost expecting this message, is that correct? That's right. So the right. military coup took place on the 1st of February, 2021. I'm stuck in a quarantine hotel in Yangon. Um, five days, i trying to get out, but it's in the middle of COVID. No scheduled flights, no way really to get to the border. I knew I was going to be watched. I was pretty high profile. And I thought, okay, I think this is going to be trouble. Right. And, and that just confirmed it. That confirmed it. Right, before we go into that and beyond, take me back to when you first sort of got into um, this role and uh, why you got into it. So I was just a humble academic at Macquarie Uni in Sydney, teaching students all about economics. Uh, But as an academic, we teach, but we do research as well. And my research was all about creating financial institutions and good economic policies for countries that have neither. Basically, so countries like Myanmar or Afghanistan. So no infrastructure as such. No infrastructure, trust networks destroyed, no real functioning taxation system, government spending, central bank all over the place, you know, all of that sort of thing. So your job is to come in and sort of identify or build some kind of structure in order for the country to function more efficiently. That, that's exactly right, mate. But Myanmar meant much more to me because also my research was very much centred on that country. So I've oh, always yeah. been a big believer, mate, that, um, that to advise properly, you have to know something about the country. So I'd spent a lot of years researching Myanmar's history and I wrote a book on the country's monetary and financial story. Um, and yeah, so prepared the, the way, if you like, and then the sort of more technical aspects of being an advisor come into use as well, but also that deep institutional, cultural and other history too. You're great at your job. You love what you do. You know, you're extremely, uh, you're an extremely wanted uh, individual because 
you know, these infrastructures are needed in the, in these certain countries. So with Myanmar, that was something that you studied. So you always knew that you'd probably end up there or visiting or helping that country out. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly, yeah. mate. So w- when I first got involved, I got to meet a lot of people from Myanmar or Burma, of course, mm-hmm. as it's yeah, sometimes Burma, called. Right, yeah. um, so I got to meet a lot of those people who had fled the country and were part of the opposition. And because I was an economist, they, are, they said to me, you know, a few times, Sean, can you help us out a little bit and do critiques on the military that ruled even back then as well? So the military keeps coming in and out of Burma. Um, so, yeah, I first started doing work for them 30 years ago. Um, so I always knew that that one day I might be able to go there if the military ever left the scene and a democracy ever came to be. Uh, so I thought I might end up there. And then in 2016, when Dorang Sang Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy took over, um, they said to me, Sean, well, look, why don't you come over and give us a hand? So 2016, are you excited about this new draft that you get? Do you know that you're going to spend, you know, years there? Is it like a, is it like a, a tour or a, or a posting where they say, right, Sean, we need you over here for three or four years, five years maybe. Uh, are you happy to come? How did that, how did that pan out when you first went over there? Yeah, so... It happened exactly like that. So uh, I was asked, could I come over? Um, And I got the support of my university, uh, the Australian government. Most importantly of all, I got the support of my wife. Yeah. um, And and went to Myanmar. A little bit unsure of what, uh, how long I'd be there. I thought it would probably be about five years because the term of government, so this government that was elected uh, in 26 or came into office in 2016, its first term was five years. So I thought, it was a good chance I'd be there that five years, but it w- wasn't actually locked in. Um, but yeah, so I knew I had five years and then uh, perhaps a bit longer as well. So 2016, you go over there. Um, is your wife worried? Have you got children at this stage as well? Sure do. Have a daughter, Fu Wong, um, okay. who at that point was in her late teens. Um, yeah, I think there was a little bit of worry, but my uh, my wife is from Vietnam and uh, she's a very tough cookie, mm-hmm. uh, very rational and all that. And um, uh, she, she looked- almost pushed you out the door, go, yeah. go and do your job, go and yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah. That's that's always great to have a great uh, a great partner that pushes you in- like that because I've got I've got the same one. So, right. Um, yeah, but you always need the sign off, though, don't you? To make Absolutely. Sure that, 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 you know, oh, that yes. Everyone's happy and, and yep. that, you know, yep. um, whilst you're out there, everything is is taken care of back home. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, you have to focus 100% on your yep. job, right? This isn't a job That's that you're right. going to go in, you know, have nice dinners at night, you know, lunches in the afternoon. You've got work to do and from the ground up. Yep. Who was your sort of liaison? Who, who did you go out there with? Who was your sort of partner um, when you hit the ground? Yeah, so my major partner in many ways was the the country's civilian leader, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who I'd known for a long time, 20 or so years, uh, always got it on really well with her, and uh, she was the person who invited me over. Do you think being associated or being, let's say, probably the right-hand man of the civilian leader, um, do you think there was a, a target on your back from the moment that you entered the country? Yeah, I do. Um, And for some very specific reasons as well. Um, So I think more generally, you know, if you're there as a a foreign advisor, you're always going to have a target in a sense anywhere. You know, it's always sensitive stuff like that, right? Particularly sensitive in Myanmar, though, because one of the things that the military had always uh, attacked Aung San Suu Kyi about was that she was under the control of foreigners somehow. So famously, her husband was British and her kids were born in England and all that. And But, you know, she was so beloved by the, the Burmese community and remains so. But, um, but the military would just try to think of anything that they could against her. So they always had this trope that somehow, yeah, she was a foreigner, that behind her were foreigners pulling the strings. Foreigners like that. you. Foreigners like Coming them. in, pulling the strings. Exactly. Was that always in the back of your head um, and how how much of that uh, was a distraction knowing that you uh, you had this target on your head? Yeah, so funny. So I was aware of it, but I think I underestimated the importance of it. I think I only learned how significant it was much later. So it wasn't always on my mind at all, but I was aware of it. I remember particularly becoming aware of it because a local newspaper once had my, uh, an opposition, well, when I say opposition, a military aligned newspaper uh, had my photo on the front page. Um, and I look really sinister. They, they'd taken it from Facebook and it's just a picture of me with my, my lo- looking like a James Bond villain with my, um, my, my hands sort of together and look like I'm plotting to take over the world. Did you have a cat? 
Oh, almost, <laughs> <laughs> not quite missing the cat, but everything else was yeah, like that. Yeah. And and so they had this big picture on the front page, and then the headline said, "Colonel Sladen returns." And Colonel Sladen disappeared to history now, but he was the British officer who handed over the last Burmese king to the British authorities and then allowed uh, Burma to, you know, become part of the British Empire, took over Burma. So I was being compared to that oh. to that betrayer uh, of the last British, uh, last Burmese king. And so, yeah, the message was pretty clear. Um, but again, it, not, notwithstanding that I saw that, I remember I, I thought it was quite funny. Like yeah, it was, of course. You, know, you didn't realise um, the severity of it, I suppose. Not at all. And, and it was only much later, you know, when I'm being questioned by police and all this sort of stuff, that the full extent of the xenophobia about this sort of stuff really became apparent to me. So you're in the country for four years at this stage. When do you sense or get the first sniff of things could go potentially wrong, a military coup could come in and, uh, and take us out ultimately? Very, very late. Very so, okay. yeah, real admission here, I did not see it coming. Oh, you um, didn't? No. Um, so an election had taken place, the second election. So twenty late 2020, election had, had come about and, and the uh, civilian government under the National League for Democracy elected for a new five-year term. The rumblings were definitely there all over the place. The military was really unhappy. And a very strange thing happened as well. This is almost exactly the same time as the US elections that Trump lost. And inspired by him, maybe, a little bit unclear, um, the military were reacting to their loss. And it was huge loss. It wasn't like the American election loss. This was a landslide again uh, to the National League for Democracy. But the military started to talk like Trump did, that this was rigged, this was fake. um, And so you're getting that rumbling along. The writing's on the wall Yep, And it's beginning to go up. The temperature's going up. The voices are raised, all that. But I still thought, so So I knew all this was going on, so I wasn't quite totally unaware, but I didn't think they would do it. They were still looking pretty sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd not been able to touch their funding mm-hmm. and some of their key things. We're, you know, we're beginning to get near it, but they're still in a cosy position um, and they're letting a lot of the things that were going wrong in, in Myanmar at that time, probably people remember the, the terrible things going on in Rakhine State to a, a ethnic group called the Rohingya. It was a genocide actually being committed by Myanmar's military against them. So all sorts of things going wrong, of which the civilian government was being blamed. And the military government, even, the military, even though they were doing it, was sort of just sitting back and letting the civilian government take the heat. So things for them were sort of looking good, you know. So I thought... There's no way they're going to step up in the form of a coup because at the moment they're in a nice position. They've got all their resources locked up. Um, They can just coast along and push back in smaller ways if they need to. I didn't think that they would actually go the full measure of taking over. Well, you said there you were getting closer and closer to potentially controlling their budgets, you know, the military itself, you know, letting government take full control. When did you know that this was going to happen. Do you remember the day when someone said, Sean, listen up, mate, we're in a lot of trouble here. The military are coming. Indirectly, Indirectly. I, I found out. So okay. so I, I was there in my hotel, um, forced two-week quarantine, because, mm-hmm. again, this is COVID. Right. But I was about to come out of quarantine, um, and so I rang the office of Aung San Suu Kyi and said, um, I'm going to come up. So I, I was in Yangon, which is the big major city of, of Myanmar down the bottom. Give uh, Dorsu, as she's known, Aung San Suu Kyi, a call and said, um, Dorsu, I'm coming out of quarantine in a couple of days. I'll come up to the capital, to Napidor, where you are. Um, and I've got all the documents for, for the big new plan that we're, we're going to work through. And, and she said, great, Sean, come up. We'll celebrate the new term. We'll have a big meeting on the Thursday and all that. Um, but then... A few days later, she says, you know what, Sean, just postpone it a little bit. Just stay down in Yangon for a bit. She said, I'm, I'm just a little bit worried about rogue elements of the military on the roads. Uh, and you might get caught up with them and they'll, they'll know who you are. Could be trouble. So, so, so how far from where the, your compound was to where her offices were? Oh, so how many, a long how many drive. Kilometers? A couple of hours. 500 drive? kilometers. Oh, oh well, 
Something okay. like that, mate. Yeah. So yeah, there long, could be illegal uh, checkpoints along the way. Absolutely. Especially you've got sensitive documentation on you, sensitive information. Was there any more red flags that came your way before you got arrested? Not to me personally. I later found out among some people who I was in prison with that, that they saw many other flags. Right. Uh, as later on. So you saw that one flag. Just the one flag from the for leader. Me. One flag for me and it wasn't quite enough. No. Um, but other people had much better antenna for local politics because, again, even though I've been there for such a long time, I'm not a local, you know, and you, you miss stuff, particularly when the language is so different, culture is so different and all that. So, but, yeah, so me and my friends of mine, they were much more certain. They even packed their bags the day before the coup and thought, okay, we're probably going to be arrested. Let's get a bag packed. Mm. Not for me. <laughs> no, not for you. So the second flag, I suppose, and the the warning flag that got you moving was the message that I mentioned, that a voice message. Now, where did that come from? Is it through your phone? Through the phone. A voice note and an email. Right. Um, no identification, which was the, the significant thing. The person said, remained anonymous. Um, they asked me to actually remove it from the phone. And so wow. I thought, all right, this is, this is serious because this person is very concerned about their own safety. What's the first thought process in your head once you hear that? Oh, um, first just that rising panic. <laughs> uh, then I thought, okay, I've got to be calm. I've got to just think this through. What what do I do? And first thing I thought of was I've got to ring the Australian embassy and tell them what, what's going on. Um, so I did that uh, and the Australian ambassador, Andrea Faulkner, took the call and said, Sean, I'm coming around there. You probably should pack your things and let's see what we can do. So it then, be, then, no, actually, I think I phoned my wife before the ambassador, actually. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> Priorities. Priorities, Sean. Um, yep. Then the ambassador. Yeah, because uh, you don't know if you're going to speak to her that's, again for a while, right? Absolutely. Yep. And so I said to her, darling, look, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think I'm going to be all right, but this is going on and things might develop. Um, but then it became just a practical matter of like, of packing for a start, mm. But then a very, very critical thing came to mind. I'm working there. And as you mentioned earlier, I've got documents. I've, I've got all my spreadsheets. I've got reform documents. I've got confidential memos uh, between all the reformers. I've got all this stuff. And I thought, you know what? I cannot let the military get hold of this stuff. Um, but what do I do? Um because I'd, I'd been aware, I should just backtrack, a couple of days earlier I'd been worried about this, contacted Macquarie Uni in Australia and said, look, how do I get things off a computer if, if things were to go bad? They said, look, to be really honest though, in these electronic devices, these hard drives of computers, if anything has been on the drive, nothing short of the complete physical destruction of that drive will render it yeah, completely safe. Completely, yeah. So... I'd done that. I'd deleted, emptied the trash, reformatted the hard drive, but I'm still sitting there that morning. I get the message and I've got my computer and I thought, gosh, these guys are going to be able to access this. And then I thought, but what do I do? And I should say that my hotel room is on the ninth floor, mm -hmm. so the police and military intelligence are all down in the lobby. And you are I'm thinking. This. And I'm thinking... What do I do? I mean, I can't burn it in the room. I've, I've got nothing to set fire to it anyway. And I thought, if I throw it from the window, now, A, I don't want to do that. This mm -hmm. is my brand new computer. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, I thought, well, probably the, the hard disk is not going to break anyway. But also, what a way to signal guilt of something, right? And, and have them really going after the computer. And you're not trained for this, Sean. And you know, I'm not remotely trained. trained at all. Not remotely you trained. You know, you're there to yep. do your job. You bring yep. your experience, your knowledge, your intellect into into structure in a country. You know, anything to do with security or, you know, getting rid of, um, we call it SSE, site-sensitive equipment. Right. You're not, you haven't got a clue. When this happens, you go from putting yourself almost into... A, a, a James Bond mindset into a you know into a mindset of actually I've got to, I've got to act like a you know like I know what I'm doing because ultimately I've got all this information 
you know, and they're they're seeing me as a as a an operative, you know, rather than someone that's coming in. They're now seeing you as the enemy, right? As that you know exactly what you're doing, you know, when it comes to this, you're going to get rid of all the information, you're going to get out of the country un unrecognized or unnoticed, and that's completely opposite. Yep. To who you are or how you're trained, right? Yep, <laughs> totally opposite. Totally opposite. I'm this naive <laughs> academic. The one upside, though, was I was a reader, voracious, yeah. I always have been of everything, but including things like espionage mm-hmm. novels mm-hmm. and and yeah. true story, you know, things like that. So I, so I was trying jumping to think, into that mindset. I'm trying to jump into that mindset. I'd also grown up reading all the old World War Two stories and all that, and how to behave, and because throughout the whole thing, that was on my mind all the time. How do I live up to everything that I used to read? Um, yeah, all the old POW stories, Great Escape, Coldest Story, all the, all this sort of stuff. That's in my mind as well. Uh, and also, you know, I was a reasonably high profile figure, as I mentioned with that newspaper article and, you know, all that. So I thought, okay, I've got to be calm. I've got to be very deliberative. Uh, I've got to be calm as a way of getting out of this situation as well. Because the, the other thing, and this is another reason why I didn't throw the computer out the window, was because I thought, well, hang on, they, they might just be, they're just going to ask me some questions, scare me, tell me to get out of the country, put me on a plane. Maybe they'd take me a cup for a few days, maybe a few hours, something like that. Yeah, so course, yeah. at that point, you know, I'm thinking de-escalate, yeah. talk my way out of mm-hmm. it, be calm. Humanise yourself. Humanise yeah. myself, mm-hmm. all of that sort of thing. So, yeah, so even though in retrospect it would have been great to have destroyed the computer somehow, it just wasn't plausible and it, and it wouldn't have been a tactic worth doing with the information I had at the time. So as you're packing up, you've got this message you're packing up, um... What's your game plan? What's your strategy moving forward? Because you, are you just going to jump into a vehicle and try and make your way to the nearest airport? What's your game plan from from the moment you get this message? Yeah, so the game plan was was difficult, be, mm. again, because of COVID. So there's no flights in and out. The only flights are there are those very chartered flights at the time, these emergency flights, That's flying right. workers in and out. Um so I knew that going to the airport wouldn't wouldn't be a good idea. I wouldn't be able to do it. My only thinking really was, okay, I've rung the ambassador, mm-hmm. perhaps getting to the Australian embassy, yep. maybe even being under siege there, I don't know, something like that. But I thought we could then talk our way out. It would become a diplomatic issue and that might be a solution. Um the Americans were doing some wonderful stuff of getting people to the border in cars, things like that. Yeah. They, they were they, – they knew some at-risk people and mm-hmm. were doing some great things on that. So I thought perhaps something like that. But I knew I had to sort of get into the diplomatic circle of events. That that was really the only game plan. Apart from, again, that sort of optimism that I still had at the back of my head that they just let me go anyway. Yeah. That, again, course. after a couple of hours, scaring the life out of me – they then leave me alone. I, I, I guess that that was still, I think that was still my dominant thought. A glimmer of hope in the yeah. back of your head. Yep. And when you realise that they're not going to let you go, yep. that this is real, that you are in a whole world of pain, of hurt, and they're just about to strip you down to your bare bones, yep. when do you realise that you're not going anywhere? So I think th- I realised that after about three hours in the lobby with them. So they're detaining me in the lobby of the hotel. So you've You've packed your bags, gone out, gone down. Have you gone down to to get a car to to escape? Yep. So I got into the lobby Mm -hmm. and here's how the economist in me got me undone as well. (laughs) I should have gone out the back door. I went out the front door and the main reason I went out the front door was because I had to pay the bill. Right, of course you do. You've got to pay the bill, right? There's a debt. You've got to pay it. So we're going to pay the bill. Sure. You are so, an honourable man, I can say. I can I can say that for sure. So literally the moment I'm getting my credit card out, I'm handing it to the lady behind concierge and I can feel them all coming in behind me. So they're detaining me more or less exactly as the Australian ambassador is walking into the lobby. Wow. And then we get a standoff because the Australian ambassador, to her immense credit, just said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not arresting him. You're not taking him anywhere. This is procedure now. And so we just sit and a, and a standoff then takes place for the next few hours. But I think the moment that – I'm still reasonably confident through this time. I'm still thinking we can talk our way out of it. They're going to let me go. The ambassador's there. It's now a country-to-country issue. Uh, I'm thinking they're not, not going to do this. But after about three hours, they, they, they started to move and they asked me to go to my luggage and 
take out some necessary clothing, put them in a small bag, and to take that with me. And then they said, we are taking you away. So I'm, I'm taken off to this cell, and I, I hesitate to even describe too much of this cell. It was filth personified. Um, this was like a, a cell would have been built 100 years ago. You're going to catch something straight away, right? Full of the detritus of 100 years. And, and, and then the horrifying moment, the rat, this giant rat appears in the cell. What's the first night like? Uh, first night was awful because um, – so I tried to sleep for a bit and then around two in the morning I get pulled out of the cells and I go into the main office of the police station and there's a whole bunch of police all standing around an object and the object was my computer and they're tapping away at it, trying to get access to it and they can't get past the password and so they pushed me down in on a seat in front of the computer and said, password – are they physical with you at this stage? Are they, uh, they, like, they're roughly rough, yeah. pulling me and pushing, not yeah. punching or anything like no, but that. giving you a good message of like... That's right, Listen, eh? yep. there's a password there. Yep. Do yep. what's right. Yep. Thrust in front of this computer, told to tap away the password, and I said, no, this is my private uh, machine. You, you can't have it. You must do it. Uh, and then I, I thought, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do here. So I typed in... An incorrect, you know, again, I'm trying to think what to do. Of course, yeah. so I trying tried, to buy a bit of time, I, aren't you? Buying time, yeah, yeah, no yeah, real ID, yeah. mm-hmm. but just trying to buy time. So I type in a password and it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And I go, oh, gee, I, I can't remember. Mm, that old chest um, <laughs> <the> old chest <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the senior policemen just come right up to me, put his face right up my, in my face and said, you will never see your wife and daughter again if you don't put in the right password. And again, I sort of hesitated a bit. I thought, well, I, I just got to do this. I, I don't know because I'm totally alone at this point. Um, and I thought, I don't know. And, and then I still hoped, of course, that I'd done the deletions and I still hoped that, you know, maybe they couldn't access stuff and all that. So, yeah, so I typed it up. And I'll never forget the moment when, um, so, you, you know, everyone will know this, you type your password in and all your icons come up on the screen, all the familiar and family pictures and all that. Never forget that moment in this, yeah, this moment of pure horror that all these familiar things, comforting things, all just sort of spring out with the, the little bells that the computer makes when you when you first open it up. Um, no, yeah, no. horrible moment. What, your heart sinks? Heart sinks. And then I just get escorted back to the cell. And, but then roused again about an hour later and they said, John, we're going. And I was put into a van, handcuffed and all that, armed police all around me, put into a van, driven through the very dark streets of Yangon because there's a curfew and a blackout. We're going northwest and I had two thoughts. Northwest of Yangon is the airport. Northwest of Yangon is insane prison. And I had two images then. I thought one was... Gosh, maybe they just take me to the airport. The other one was, they're taking me to Insane. Um, and unfortunately, that's where they were taken. Insane is the name of the prison, right? Insane, it's the most wonderfully, horribly named prison in the mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. Spelled I N S E I N, but yeah. pronounced insane. Insane, yeah. And Insane describes everything about it. So there's hope when you're driving, hope that you're going to go, you're going to take the left road, that's right. The right, and you end up how do you know that you're going to yep. insane is there a moment you think this isn't working out for there me? is there okay. was literally a fork in the road and because <laughs> I, i'm quite familiar with yangon by now yeah. and so we're going on the northern pa road and then and it suddenly diverted off to the right was to the airport and to the left was inside and we took the left fork and i thought and that's okay this is not good <laughs> that's when you knew that's when i did yeah. your heart sink then as well yep yeah so you, this yep. is literally going from from bad to yep. worse to yep. horrific Absolutely. And and I'm tired and it's hot and, yeah, and I've had a day, you know, because what, we're about 12, 14 hours into the drama now. I'm exhausted, uh, despairing, um, yeah, just horrible. And when you arrive at the prison, are mm-hmm. you processed like a prisoner? Do you, so that, do you, do you think, right, this, I'm going to be doing some time here, you know, because when you get processed and you get given your, your, your coveralls or whatever it may be, were you put in the prison and processed like that? No. So the no. processing didn't happen until a couple of months later. But 
But before it was worse because, yeah, so the processing was a terrible event two months down the track. Where I was put for two months was just in a box, um, windowless box inside this little headquarters of CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, that had this building right outside the walls of the prison. So the prison is behind me. So that first night and for the next two months, I'm not actually inside the prison walls. I'm just outside the walls in this, yeah, headquarters of CID, put into this box, and, and I like to call it the box because that's what it was. It was so, yeah. like a, the size of a, one of those 20-foot containers, shipping containers, just like that. It's got nothing in it except a concrete floor and a steel chair bolted to the concrete floor in the centre of the room, and there's leg chains, uh, chains for your wrists and manacles. Um, like leg irons and all that attached to this. So chair. you are That's getting it. the full treatment. You, they yep. are that you are the espionage. You are the James Bond here. That they are treating you exactly like that. Yep. So they are putting you in. They don't want you to escape or have any form of of uh, what's going on in the outside world whatsoever. Exactly. Right. And and all of this is extra legal. There's no so no processing. No no charges. No, no, uh, d- didn't tell me what I was there for, uh, the, anything about it. Like the, all the normal procedures, even under their own laws and regulations, none of that applied. So for two months I was in this limbo and, yeah, just alone, solitary confinement, nothing to read, nothing to, to do. Was that a trigger moment in you? Did you ever think to yourself, wow, they've got this so wrong? Yeah. And well, was that like soon or was that when you were doing a bit bit more time, shall we say. Bit more time, because mm. again, I still thought that they, they can't b- believe this, right? This is this is absurd. The whole thing's absurd and, and they're just going to release me at some point. Yeah, because you know what you know, right? I know what I know. Like I know I'm not, you know, Jason Bourne or James Bond or whatever. Um, but, but then the interrogators come in. So this whole time I'm in the box for two months, the only people who come to see me are the interrogators. Um, and, and I have to go into that chair, sometimes have the chains attached, sometimes not. They come in, bring a little folding table and sit there in front of me, have one person asking the questions, another person taking notes, often another one just wandering around, I think, to make me you know, feel a bit nervous and all that. Um, but constantly putting stuff to me about what I was doing. I, I was directly told that I was a member of MI6, um, which surprised me actually because ASIO never got a mention, the CA <laughs> never got a mention, it was MI6. I thought, okay, um, I'm, one level I'm flattered, but, <laughs> but at a more other, important level, I'm not. <laughs> so they did all of that and absolutely as I feared, they told me that they'd given my computer to the Russians and that the Russians had reconstructed the hard drive and got all these documents that prove my espionage. Even though all the documents, I mean, there were government documents, you know, because that's what I was there for. Yeah, I, was, I was working yeah. with them. Um, but they, in a sense, made it out that, that I had been gathering this. This was part of the, the cachet of, of, um, of yeah, my, the, the booty of my espionage, mm-hmm. proof of my guilt. Um, and, uh, yeah, would just sort of berate me about this. And, um, and how did you keep yourself sane so you know the the major way, and I'm not sure whether this is more a, a truth more broad. I paced up and down the cell because I had nothing to do, nothing to read or anything like that. So I would walk from one end of the cell to the other. It was only eight paces, but I knew it was eight. So I would count, and funnily enough, that constant walking backwards and forwards and counting, counting out loud sometimes, was quite soothing. And I, I think there's something like really basic about that, like in the way that animals do that in the zoo, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe there's something comforting in, in even just the counting. Um, so I was going do through that. your head during that, those moments. Well, or, or, or was there nothing going through your head? Yeah, That's why it was so soothing. I remember just thinking, at some point they're going to realise, and and that sanity will prevail. You know, so I, I always had that. The pacing and the counting was to not think, uh, because there'd be moments where it would become overwhelming. And, and I would really start to panic and I'd think, okay, I've just got to get up and walk. And I would walk really quickly and all that. Um, and then I'd start to think, try and think of things to take my mind away. So, um, yeah, I'm a lover of history, but particularly American history. So I tried to list all the American presidents in order um, and, and count the number of US states, come up with all 50 states. Um, so I do things like that um, as a so way keeping of keeping your mind active. Yeah, I think yes. this is super important for it being in any any situation is yeah trying to trying to keep your mind active trying to keep it 
you know, not overthinking yep. because in a situation like this, this could be your undoing, but keeping it active and, and keeping, you know, keeping yourself on your, on your toes because at any given moment you could have been pulled into that interrogation cell. Any given moment you could have been asked uh, really, really difficult questions. So even though you say pacing, you know, you could switch off, but you can never really switch off in a situation like that. Did you feel the pressure and the, uh, and the stress of that, um, you know, bearing down on you? Absolutely. And and you could feel it in the pit of your stomach. So I lost a huge amount of weight at this period. God, there's nothing um, to you anyway, Sean. Yeah, uh, but I lost about 20% of my body weight at that time. So I'm, uh, well, I've recovered now, so I'm 55 kilos now. So I got down to about 43, something like that. Um, and part of it was because the food provided both then and later in the prison was awful beyond belief and of course you get food poisoning and all that sort of stuff um but also i had no appetite i'm as nervous as hell um food eating food was not in any way pleasurable um so yeah lost a huge amount of weight um and then just yeah just constantly trying to strategize think it through stay optimistic divert my mind um was there hope with each day that today could be the day that i get out or the day could be the day that i get released that was the strangest thing, yeah, particularly in that early period. I always swung every day on either, A, I'm now going to be taken into Insane, that's sitting there behind me, mm-hmm. the big old prison, or I'm going to be taken to the airport and sent back to Australia. I, I had those complete yeah. dichotomy of outcomes on just about every single day. And yeah. and and sometimes, you know, that my so I'm in this box and I'm, lock, I'm sleeping in this box with this chair and the chains and all that in that 24 hours a day, but the interrogators would come and that was awful. But I would hear the the locks being undone to this box and I would give two emotions at the same time. Hope, maybe they come to let me go. Or no, actually it's just the interrogators coming back to Do have another Do you think that's go. what kept you uh, alive? Do you think that's what kept you sane? Do you think that's yep. what kept you, you know, on your game? Because that hope is hope is such a precious precious tool isn't it and if you can if you can get hold of that and and maintain it and hold hold it tight then it will get you through to the next day yep and and i think also again i'm a really keen student of history uh i grew up with all those those world war ii stuff and all that and i wanted to measure up i i don't Mm -hmm. want i almost can't overstate that enough I, I knew that this would be recorded by myself, if no one else, that, that, that this was a test and I had to get through it, that, that this was, I couldn't be the guy who broke mm-hmm. um, and I just had to get through it. This fate had delivered this to me, but i just got to get through it and I'll get home and I can't break down. I've, I've got to come back whole. I've got to come back and, and be the person who I was. And, um, yeah, so, so I think that, that, that was really important. And you've um, become part of history. So you do 650 yeah. days in the end, is that right? That's right. Eh? 650 yeah. days in prison. So yep. you get the moment you get processed, yep. do you do you then know that right, I'm going to be here for a long time? Yeah. So yeah. I, I knew then I was going to be there for months. Mm-hmm. Then then they finally formally charged me and, and they put me on trial with Aung San Suu Kyi, with the with other the leader. Reformers, they put you on. With the leader. Wow. So we were part of the same case. Mm-hmm. And so I, as soon as I knew that was happening, I thought, okay, this is this is not going to happen anytime soon. Um, and so the trial itself lasted a year and a half. Um, and, um, and that whole time you were locked up? Whole time we were locked up. I, I I was moved about halfway through from insane prison, which was bad enough, to an even worse one up in the capital of Napidor, a more modern prison, but much worse. It was just terrible. The, the food was bad, the guards were bad, the conditions were bad, everything was just horrible. And literally a sort of concrete cell, old iron bars, um, rats and insects coming in and out all the time. You were um, treated like a supervillain, weren't you? Because when you were getting transported, wasn't there like 20 guards, you were yeah. shackled up, you were, <laughs> so I bet you were like, guys, it's, yeah. it's, it's just me, I'm, you know, it's... Wow, why are you going through all of this just to move me? And yeah, so they must have really, really had it out for you, or really one hundred percent thought that you were this Jason Bourne character, and at any given moment you're going to break free and uh, and 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 flee the country. Well, just on that, and you mentioned Jason Bourne because it's highly relevant at this point. Um, on one of the movements, 
uh, between the two prisons from Napidor back to Insane later on, I was not only put in handcuffs, I had to wear leg irons and leg irons had like a, a solid steel bar between the two leg irons of, of my ankles, which I meant, you know, that I had to sort of waddle along. Um, I was had to wear the prison clothing and all that sort of thing as well. Um, there were 18 sharpshooters with me for this journey, just transferring me from between the two prisoners. Um, and, and I always remember as the leg irons were being put on, I said to this guy who I knew could speak English and I said to him, you don't have to do this. I'm I'm a 58 year old academic. I'm not Jason Bourne. So I <laughs> literally said, said Jason yeah. Bourne to him, yes. um, and he just looked at me and sort of shrugged his shoulders, and then responded with some words I never ever thought I'd hear my whole life. He said, "I'm just following orders," and I thought, "Wow, you know the Nuremberg defence now getting quoted back, you know, put oh, back to me." Especially you being a historian. I That's right, like, wow. and yeah, so. Um, yeah, no, so just just crazy. I mean, um, yeah, and, and literally 18 guys um, with, I think, Chinese rip-offs of M16 mm-hmm. rifles. Yep. Um, yeah, just extraordinary. Wow, what a story. So when do you know that you're getting the hell out of there? It's a total shock, total surprise. I'm in the cell. I'm back at Insane by now, convicted. Yeah, spy and all the rest around, of it. Yeah. Yep, sitting in this concrete cell. And I just done my morning pacing. I just finished and I got my 10,000 steps. And a guard just suddenly appeared and said, Sean, good news, you're going home. And I just looked at him and, and I, I said, Look, you're messing with me. Yeah, right? yeah. And I said, yeah. Please don't do this don't, to me. Don't do this. You're not kidding. And he said, No, 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 we're, we're not kidding. But you've only got 10 minutes and you've just got to grab whatever you can and, and go. And I looked around and, I, and I, I didn't know what to do. I thought, this is the thing I've, I've waited for all those 650 days. And, and I thought, what, 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 what do I wear? Because they, they, they'd taken my shoes away. I just had these flip-flops. I'm sort of in this prison outfit. And just quickly um, going back at this stage, are you, your court case, were you proven guilty? Proven guilty, so I'm a convicted prisoner so by this time. So you're convicted at this stage. Convicted oh, and so everything. the court case goes ahead. You're convicted. Yep. Did they give you a sentence? The, they, they did. So I knew it wasn't going to be the rest of my life, mm-hmm. but but I was worried that it could be very long. So the, they gave me three years for breaches of the Official Secrets Act, mm-hmm. another three years for breaching the Immigration Act, because, of course, as soon as they convicted <sighs> me of being a spy, effectively, that meant that I broke my visa <laughs> obligations, oh. which then <laughs> got another three years for that. I was always worried that I could get four on top of that because had the documents, had the secrets so-called that I, you know, allegedly found out been military secrets, then the, then the term would have been 14 years. Um, yeah, so convicted of all of that. Um, and then, yeah, so then I'm, I'm back at Insane. I'm, I'm on death row. I'm in the prisoners of, of death row. Um, so it's a, it was a last horrible little stretch for two months uh, in this, this final stretch in Insane Prison. Um, and then they're like, you've got then, 10 seconds, get, 10 out get out of here. I bet you had have done it in two seconds, didn't you? <laughs> stumbling around, except I really didn't know what to do. I would sort of pick stuff up, put it back down again, think, what do I take? And then I remember my wife said, Sean, don't bring any clothes or anything else home yeah. with you. <laughs> so I thought, just okay, come back as you that's are. it. I just will walk out. Yeah. One thing I walked out with that I did come out with, which was a an elephant made of old coffee sachets that another prisoner had made, had crafted, sculpted into this beautiful little elephant. So I took that away with me. Wow. But apart from that, one souvenir, one souvenir, uh, walked to the prison guardhouse, taken in a bus to the airport, got on a plane, business class. So I went from from a dirty concrete cell, business class on this plane, got back to Australia, so wonderful. The Prime Minister even then took me on the private jet uh, the final leg from Melbourne to Sydney. So with, literally within 24 hours, I went from this filthy, dank concrete cell in Yangon to the cabin of a private jet coming back to, on a beautiful sunny day in Sydney, just looking down, seeing the harbour and all that. And it was wow. just, wow. <laughs> Amazing story. And, and any advice that you'd give to people um, that believe that their world is crumbling around them, there's no way out, they see no way through, what would the one piece of advice you'd give to, to people who are in that situation? I think is to think about what happens afterwards, that this will pass. Um, 
and that you you have a life afterwards and that you need, in a sense, to live with yourself. Um, in, in some ways, I think I coped in very old-fashioned ways. This wasn't modern psychology or anything. This was trying to measure up to, you know, old ideas of what, of what, you, adapted. You, what you did. Adapted. The yep. adaptability, right? Yep, and adapted to that, realising that there's a future, um, yeah, and, the, and that it will pass. And, and then, I suppose, do anything to keep your mind healthy. And and sometimes that, that is physical things, mm-hmm. frankly, that that's really Absolutely. important. Just pacing up and down, read as much as you can if you can get access to books and things like that. Use your own mind to explore things that you know. Um, recall all of that. Um, yeah, but, but I'd say the most important thing is to see the other side um, and you'll get there. Sean, thank you so much for coming on Head Game. Looking at you, you know, it's all about psychological resilience. And yeah, listen, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and Likewise, mate. Sean's book is called An Unlikely Prisoner. You can find the link in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining me on Head Game. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of our incredible stories. And leave me a review wherever you're listening. I'm Matt Middleton. Catch you again next time.